the rights again. In the rain. So. In the rain, in the rain. We're to take on Lendl and the accusers this time, huh? I've done some digging about him. Why is Hedwin Volpert suddenly? Yeah. Ah, well. Be more American, come on. Can I tell you what he knows of your next adversary? Lendo the Liar, the first adversary you confronted in the rights not long after you took your first steps on the path to freedom. He's the cold-mannered head of the accusers and bears an old grudge against the Nightwings. A former constable of the Commonwealth, he gained a reputation for his strict and brutal manner by any means. He always caught the croak. Once he arrested a civilian, hated him on suspicion of theft of Commonwealth artifacts that had gone missing. Lendl discovered the artifacts himself in the civilian's home. The suspect was soon exiled. Still, he denied the charges, even as they cast him down river. The case was investigated further, though too late. Suspicions turned to Lendl. It turned out he planted the damning evidence himself, so he was exiled in turn. In the downside, he soon became acquainted with the rights, having heard of all of this from several people in high places. He asserted himself as the de facto leader of the accusers. They bent his aggressive nature and prevailed many times under his watch. Yet, each time his chance at liberty arose, the Nightwings either defeated him or simply did not show. <laughs> I know, it's weird. You have to do a voice. I guess that's why he doesn't care for us. No matter, though. We'll soon give him more reason. See you in the morning, my friend. You bet have a good evening. At dawn, you shall take flight again. Wagon! In the wagon! In the wagon! It's, it's me! Oh! Big bird She's move. got cards! Unusual etched cards depicting the greater titans, probably for curses and enchantments. Having a look around outside, exploring with May, lifting heavy objects, hunting for snacks, exploring with Hedwin, standing watch. Let's oh, look at anything but her. She's too spooky. The rites of flame in the words of Slam mirror the last of his name. With these blackened nails do I hereby inscribe the rites of flame. The bylaws shall be written here in full. We the eight decree the rites attest of one's true worth in body, mind, and spirit. Now until the stars abandon us shall this be binding law within the downside. Those deemed worthy in the rites are to regain their freedom from the downside and return from whence they came. Exiles shall conduct the rites as one of nine triumphants and look toward the stars for guidance on their path. Exiles shall bear this book as status. You're cold. There's another page! page. Essential structure. In the words of Slave Mirror, last of his name, the essential structure of a rite shall be as follows. Where chosen by the stars within the dark of night, shall two triumphant stand in opposition, far enough afield beside their consecrated pyres, symbolizing their resolve. In each triumvirate, the three shall act as one to demonstrate their trust in one another, not just in themselves. Triumphants shall endeavor to extinguish the pyre of their adversary, whose flames are only to be staunched through a celestial orb descended from the stars. Whosoever pyre remains burning shall prevail, the triumphants are to disperse. Ooh, there's more pages. And another page. Searching the stars. We the eight have seen the turning of the stars from now until the ending of our age. Heed their guidance and ours. The stars take many cyclic turns. The rites commence at their behest upon celestial landmarks where the downside's greater titans fell before the heavens. Bearing this book postponed upon your triumvirate, you, the reader, shall perceive under which stars you are to congregate. Follow where they lead as your adversary shall. If either of you fails to appear, then neither of you walks the path. Whether you prevail or you fail, from that point the star shall guide you on. Is there another page? Yep. Before each rite. Jesus Christ, there's enough fucking pages! The rite shall not commence unless the necessary preparations are complete at a celestial landmark ere the stars align. Exiles shall conduct the rites bearing this book, of which there are but forty copies, each bound in astral hide. Exiles shall wear the sacred raiments fashioned in our likeness at the summit of Mount Elodial. Their identities are to be concealed, for they shall represent us all. Exiles shall be set to shall set a metal sigil for their pyre and consecrate the grounds using the words the eight scribes gave their freedom so that we may yet have ours. The heavens shall respond when all is set. The Law of Three. During the rite, each triumphant shall act as one and erringly and without question. The disobedient shall suffer banishment or permanent expulsion. 
Exiles shall move as of single mind to demonstrate their faith and recognize that they, as we the eight, cannot prevail alone. Their, will sh their worth shall be determined both by their actions and their peers. Triumphant's lacking experience in this may designate a reader who focus on this book, whose focus on this book may help others coordinate. However, only those who shall conduct the rites firsthand shall walk the path toward enlightenment and become eligible to regain their freedom. Holy the burning fuck! Fire. At the appointed time, with the aligning of the stars, the heavens shall rain down upon the ground sufficiently prepared, and thus the two opposing pyres shall be set ablaze. Thus shall commence the rite. Triumphants are to protect their pyres as they would their lifeblood. Lifeblood itself is never to be shed, before, during, or after any rite, lest the disobeyers suffer permanent expulsion. Exile is injury enough. The rite is an act of mercy. Fear not the purifying flame. Plunge into it headlong and without fear, for you shall be protected by the stars themselves. Seek freedom in the flame. That sounds like... Commit suicide! We don't care. A little bit. The aura. Exiles during the rain and the shall reveal their hidden inner aura in the color of their flame. The aura is the exile's solitary weapon in the rites. Should one's adversary cross one's aura, the adversary shall be banished. Banishment is fleeting nothingness. Seek the pyre's light and thus make your return. The exile's presence shapes the aura. The exiles gain greater auras while standing side by side with their triumphants, for we gain strength together. Exiles may cast their aura through sheer force of focus on this book. As the two flames are lit, so shall the celestial aura fall from the heavens. The one such aura shall be availed by the stars, requiring triumphants to buy for it. Its cosmic connection to the flames, the raiments in this book, bestows the necessary qualities for its bearer to prevail. Effortlessly sails the orb between the three and the triumvirate, and seeks the grasp of whoever acts among the three. Once grasped, the orb shall draw within it all the bearer's aura fueled by the triumvirate's old flame. It is to be cast into the flame. The path. In each rite, we gain enlightenment whether we prevail or we fail. Indeed, through failure, we tend to learn the most valued lessons, provided we survive. Nag among us, among us have prevailed without end. Exiles who walk... The path toward enlightenment shall at all times be struck by an epiphany and achieve mastery in some respect. Choose well amongst these blessings we bestow, thus you may yet achieve your potential and surpass your adversaries. Whenever you prevail, your triumphant earns favor. In time, the triumphant with the most favor shall be summoned to the liberation rite to earn a chance at freedom. Then the cycle shall begin anew. Liberation! The liberation rite <laughs> takes place upon the fall of slave under a blooded moon. Witnessed by the heralds from the stars. Oh. So well, Celeste and uh, Terry Gar's uh, heralds of the stars. Oh. There the most favored triumphant shall confront the one which we appoint. These two triumphants shall pass through the scribe's gate where their worth shall be assessed under the stars. Only the most enlightened exiles within each triumvirate may be anointed for a chance at freedom. Two of their companions shall support them whilst they strive. The anointed champion of the triumvirate which prevails shall then plunge into the shimmer pool and return in glory. I think. Oh my god! I think we did it. We did it! Oh my god, it's hard to Bertrude. <laughs> Have fun doing your that one. Bertrude from the other room! We beseech you. You find big Bertrude looking at the black wagon in a disapproving Hi. way. She fixes her gaze on you. Her expression does not change. <clears throat> Such You're gonna need to yeah. really speak up. There's yeah. a sound shield. Such clutter added to this wagon since we looked upon it last. Unsightly! <laughs> Remember thee from our abode in flagging hands. Then thou must be the reading one whom Sandalwood referred. Flagging hands is a gloom filled, desolate reach of the downside beyond which lies the sea. She moves in close, studying you. You recall that the mere touch of a bog crone of the southern bogs can induce paralysis, or worse, the southern bogs. It's a distant region of the Commonwealth, left well alone despite technically being a part of the nation. All right. That one such as thee can extract meaning from that tome. Twas feet we wish to witness for ourselves. Thy flesh has seen but smallest fraction of the years which ours withstood, and yet we are expected to believe that thou canst understand the Book of Rights. Yeah, actually. Wait. Cool uh, Medusa hair with antlers. Okay. I just got confused. What did that mean? 
You're so young, I don't believe you can read that shit. Oh. Okay. Then she backs away for someone else has joined you. Hail, Bertrand. Madam, is everything to your liking at this time? Or is there something more you which more which you require? <laughs> We've been unable to locate a supply of rotworm gizzard extract among thy belongings. Other than that, we shall lodge no complaint at present. <laughs> it is possible that Volsrid has a small supply among his possessions here. You are both doing real well. If you would care to accompany me, we may yet to chip procure some. Oh my god, that... That's <laughs> <I actually laughs> my throat. I think it's that baklava. Do you guys need, like, a second? You both seem to be hacking. Well, I have a screen. I think we're good. That would be agreeable with us. Yeah. Then, after you, my dad. Yeah, we're good. As they depart, you think you can see the lone minstrel nod his head your way. Thanks! Thanks for- Ooh! What? You should go see what her stuff is. Where are you looking It's right here. No, 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 no. I mean like- the... Oh, oh, in here? Yeah, yeah. With this? This, uh, Oh my this? god. Or, you, did you mean right here? No, you need to look at rookie shit. <laughs> I did it. There is a crown, Bertrude. Uh, she's got some presents to her. What do you want? That doesn't actually surprise me, considering how terrifying she is. She is a bog dweller once feared and respected in the Commonwealth for her sorceress work. She has the wedge-shaped pattern blast, the pounce which launches her forward across great distances, and the slither which moves her faster but with less control. She is a crone. We know that she is an alchemist. Um, bog dwellers on the outskirts of the Commonwealth perform profane experiments with little supervision. And she is a bog dweller of considerable notoriety here in the downside. And runs a sort of business bearing her a sort of business bearing her own name. She has a forbidding way about her, but her respect for Wolfred is evident and even borders on affection. She seems to know much of the rites, despite not having conducted them prior to joining forces with you. What was that? My necklace. How'd you manage that? Carefully. Well, it's under the couch now. Yep. I'll have to get that up for recording. <laughs> Good job. She doesn't have a lot of hope, though. No. Probably because she's a crone. <laughs> Are you saying crones can't be hopeful? Yes. Yes. Have you met Ken Kai from Yu Yu Hakusho? You rise early that morning. Though Bertrude is already awake, she scowls at you. Uh, good morning, Rita. Bertrude, I trust your stay has not been too uncomfortable. You ready to scream? Yep. <clears throat> Nay, Sandalwood, the comforts of this place are not for us. Fly us forth from here to lower the ground. Let us get on with all of this. The reader here shall do so. Once the group is ready, I thank you for your patience. Get me off this fucking mountain, says the snake lady. It's time to take off! Whoop! Whoop whoop! What what? In the butt? You are weird. Soaring far above this glorious shore, you notice Pamitha gazing down at the frozen cliffs below. That damn place down there, I like it least of all, I think. Among everywhere we've been, I'm thankful that there's no reason to return. Reminds me of my home is all, the highway remnants. We all grew accustomed to the thinner air amid the cliffs that breaches the clouds above your commonwealth. But it was not the nicest place. No wonder that my sister settled for a rather warmer base of operations in this land, there by the nest of Trista. Anyway, I'm pleased to have spent as little time possible near here. Let's fly on by and go about our business. Bailey is expressing um, the desire to 
make it seem like Whoop. a... Like, oh! oh. <laughs> Damn it! I no, this is, this is not... This isn't you. You can hear her Scourge too. of the Skies. I did her too! You can hear the angry hissing coming from Midmilde all the way from your position. You think mayhaps the skies belong to years? Foolish. The skies and everything above them and below belong to the astral born. He shall be smitten from his skies on his awakening. Now, be gone! I could have sworn I voiced her too. I did. Something about the strange island you see below draws your attention. Best to avert your gaze from the Isle of Kelmer. Even the scribes themselves thought to avoid this place. Let us fly on. It's a forbidden island nestled in the Deathless Tempest. It has significance to the eight scribes. See, I'm learning things. Is this the chastity? Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's not bother Tom. It's Pyhurst! Yeah! yeah. Well, what was that of that? You overhear Sir Deluge in a full-on panic as his fellow worm knights attempt to calm him down. Well, what do you mean it was the Nightwings? We are not to face them in our coming right again, are we? At some point he realizes your wagon is aloft beside his own. You, you Nightwing, this knight shall not forgive you th this transgression. Once we prevail against whichever adversaries are doomed to face us next, then we shall come for you. Gah, why must this knight be forced to fly so far above the land and sea? It's an air battle! Get the fuck out of my sky! They're already terrified. Okay. Oh, holy shit, we are over huh? time. Are we? Yeah, we are over time. Okay. Uh, that was my fault for not actually paying attention, so uh, if you guys enjoyed the car noises, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> And uh, we'll see you all next time. Okay. Bye. Bye.